the Parsha this week is Shemot. We're starting the new book. We're starting the book of Exodus. And um, the Parsha opens by saying, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt. Now, somebody had brought up in the Facebook group that, uh, you know, what's the difference between the usage of the word Jacob and, and Israel? And it's interesting to note that here it says Israel and not Jacob, even though we read in last week's Parsha in the last, next to the last chapter, right at the end of Bereshit in 49, it says, when Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into his bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So he wasn't called Israel at that point, even though his name had been changed many years before. He would, the Torah calls him Jacob. But then it starts this Parsha by saying the sons of Israel who came to Egypt. So anyone who spent any time reading the Tanakh knows that the Jewish people are variously referred to both as Israel and as Jacob. And so the question was asked, why? What's the difference? Well, there's a lot of disagreement, as is usual in everything Jewish, right? Nobody ever agrees on the reason for anything. But um, there's a lot of disagreement as to if there's a common thread when it refers to Jacob and when it refers to Israel. And some commentators have said there is a common thread. And other commentators have said no, because every thread that everybody tries to put together, um, there's always one place or a few places that disprove whatever the theory is, all right? And um, so I actually have a theory that I'm going to share with you guys, but we know that Jacob struggled with an angel, right? Jacob struggled with the angel, and the angel changed his name from Jacob to Israel, even though it actually he wasn't called Israel until a little bit later when God kind of reconfirmed that change, all right? But it is Jacob who struggled and Israel who overcame, all right? Jacob who struggled and Israel who overcame. So when the Tanakh, this is just Penina's theory, when the Tanakh refers to the Jewish people as Jacob, I believe that it's referring to us in the physical sense, in the nation made up of individuals, the people sense, as the, the nation that struggles in this world, that struggles for her identity, that struggles to survive, that struggles to make a, a way in a world that's oppositional to the way that God has prescribed for her, okay, that when it's referring to Jacob, it's a much more physical, natural reference, and may also be related. I talk a lot about um, the fact that the, the Tanakh, throughout the Tanakh, the Jewish people are referred to in both plural and singular, sometimes in the same sentence, right? Um, and that's because we have two separate frameworks for our relationship with God. One is as an individual, and the other is as part of the group, the nation, the klal, as we say in Hebrew. And I feel that the reference to the Jewish people as the stars in the sky and the sand in the sea actually demonstrate this. For example, if you have sand on the seashore, right, one grain of sand, what is one grain of sand? A grain of sand is like a grain of salt. It's like nothing. It's not even a pebble. It's very tiny. If you had a grain of sand, one grain of sand in your shoe, you wouldn't notice it. By itself, it is nothing. But put together with millions of other grains of sand, now it can do something. It can produce something. You know, it's used to tell time. It can be used to make artwork right? You take enough grains of sand and put it under enough heat and it can be turned into glass. And then, I mean, the invention of glass absolutely revolutionized the world, right? Before there was glass, if you lost your, if your vision wasn't great, too bad. Before there was glass, there were no microscopes or telescopes for us to see the world beyond what's right in front of our faces. Um, before there was glass, 
people lived in darkness part of the year because they had to keep their windows, you know, they had to keep their shutters closed to keep the bad weather out of their homes, right? They couldn't even have light except for what was on the fire. And the invention of glass meant that people could then have windows where even though it was inclement weather outside, they would be able to have light coming in. So between glasses and telescopes and microscopes and windows, glass revolutionized the world. And the Jewish people are like that. That is what we call the klal. As a nation, right? As an individual in reference to the nation, one disappears. But as a nation, put us together, put us under a little bit of heat, and we can revolutionize the world. And we have. We have changed the world in many ways. The stars, the reference to the Jewish people as the stars, is referring to the individual Jewish person. Because when you have a whole blanket of stars in the sky, the individual stars disappear in a way. They lose their beauty. But if you can take a telescope and look at just one star, if you take it just by itself, it has its own unique twinkle, it has its own unique color, it is beautiful by itself. But in the whole sky, in the greater context, it can disappear, right? So I feel that this reference to the Jewish people, and there are other references that kind of agree with this concept that we have we're individuals, but we're also part of the klal, part of the group. And that's why sometimes the Torah refers to us in the singular, and sometimes the Torah refers to us, or the Tanakh refers to us in the plural. And I believe that the usage of Jacob and Israel is a similar parallel. Jacob is referring to the individuals that make up the nation. It's referring to the physical. It's referring to the struggle that we have in this world with other people. And Israel refers to the Klal, it refers to the nation, but it also refers to our spiritual existence in this world and in the universe. Right. So like I said, Jacob struggled, Israel uh, overcame. Okay. So the Parsha opens up calling us the sons of Israel, because at that point we were a nation, a people. And we had become fruitful, and we had multiplied. And then it says that a new king arose over Egypt who didn't know about Joseph. Now, just to take a little excursion here, I think to myself, like, wow, what a short memory, right? I mean, think about it. Even if it had been 100 years since the famine, that's not such a long time for a major cataclysmic event. But nonetheless, they forgot. Now, think about it. In 2001, which is 16 years ago, there was a pretty major event that happened in the United States on September 11th, right? But how many people actually think about it today? I mean, right? Unless you directly lost a loved one, you're probably, you probably barely notice when September 11th runs around. I mean, it rolls around. You know, they have memorials and different things like that. But imagine in 100 years, when everyone who was around is then dead, do you think that there's still going to be 9-11 memorial services? Probably not. Um, they probably won't still be reading off the names of those who died. It will be something that maybe you accidentally come across while following a Wikipedia rabbit trail, right? You know, like, oh, yeah, that's right. I remember learning this in history on September 11th. This happened, right? So the children of Israel became numerous. The Egyptians forgot about all that Jacob had done for them. They became afraid of us as a nation. They were afraid that we were so numerous that if one of their enemies befriended us, we would join forces with them and we would fight them and we would win, you know, defeat them. And so they decided that what they needed to do was enslave us as a people to destroy our um, identity as a people, our self-worth and our value of ourselves, all right? So 
the children of Israel became numerous and the Egyptians became afraid of them and enslaved the children of Israel. Now, if enslavement, if we're going back to my theory, right? Enslavement is a physical situation. So why does it refer here to us as the children of Israel and not as Jacob? Because the enslavement was not of individuals. It was of the nation. It was a way to suppress the spiritual power of the nation of Israel. And although it used a physical means, it was really a spiritual act, if you will. Okay, so that is kind of the thought that I had on this idea of Israel versus Jacob. There were two other things that actually, there were several other things that jumped out at me, but two that I wanted to mention to you. I once did a study on the questions that God asks in the Tanakh. Uh, and I, it wasn't a complete study because I kind of lost track of, of my project. I do that a lot. I start stuff and then don't finish it. Um, but here in the Parsha this week, Moses is, uh, you know, he, Moses is born, right? In this Parsha, Moses is born and his mother puts him in a basket in the sea. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, adopts him but he's raised by his real mother. So ostensibly he knows that he's a Jew, right? I can't imagine the conflict that he had going on inside of him. Um, and then one day he sees a, an Egyptian and a Jew fighting and he ends up killing the Egyptian and then he sees two Jews fighting and all right. So at this point he's now wanted by Pharaoh because he killed someone. And so he runs away to the land of Midian where he rescues these daughters of Jethro, Yitro, and uh, he ends up staying with him. He ends up marrying his daughter, Zipporah, and um, they end up having a child. And all of this is in this week's Parsha. And during this time is when Moses discovers the burning bush, right? So God speaks to him through the burning bush, and God tells him that he's going to use him to rescue the Jewish people from the enslavement of the Egyptians. But Moses is actually quite a humble person and also lacking in self-confidence. And he's like, uh, how am I supposed to do this? And God asks Moses, what's in your hand? Right? Now, God doesn't need to know what's in Moses's hand. God knows what's in Moses's hand. God's God. And he's talking to Moses. But Moses needs to know what's in Moses' hand. Because the idea is, is that, by the way, it's a staff, right? So God tells Moses to throw down the staff. He throws down the staff and it turns into a snake. Then God tells Moses to pick it up by the tail and it turns back into a staff. The idea here that we can take away from that little passage, from this question that God asks, because anytime that God or an angel asks a question, there's something that we can take away from it. And in this case, excuse me, in this case, what we can take away from it is that you are never without resources. God has given you a lot of tools for you to be able to use to do the job that you were given in this world, right? Sometimes, though, we have to be reminded that we've got something in our hand. Right? Sometimes we, we feel empty-handed, and yet God says, what's, what's that? What's that right there? You know, what's with your ability to speak or your ability to teach or your ability to sing or your ability to whatever? It's a resource that you've been given to be able to do what you were called to do in this world. So now, use it, okay? And anybody who is willing to use that resource, to submit that resource to God, he can basically create magic in your hands. Just give it over to him and God will use it for your good.